tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 9, Episode 20. I'm your host, Otis Gyre, and in this episode, I'll be performing five tales to terrify you, courtesy of author David Fueling, about devilish desserts, eerie effigies, puzzling pests, sinister synambulants, and creepy cruises. Support for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Hello, friends. How you doing? What's going on this week? Does the impending Thanksgiving season cut you down? Although we get 365 days before the next one, it still seems so damn <laughs> daunting. There does seem to be an air of anxiety underneath all of that holiday cheer sometimes, doesn't there? Between the kids running around, adults arguing over the TV. I like my football games, but the ladies of the family want to watch the parade and dog show after. The politeness of eating things you aren't used to in order to appease the loving cook. And that's if you don't host. If you are hosting this year, well... That's a whole other can of cranberries to get into. Luckily, BetterHelp is there to help keep your mental health in check during the most hectic of seasons. They specialize in a variety of problems, including anxiety, depression, holiday stress, anger, as well as a number of other conditions or feelings. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, nor is it self-help. It's professional counseling done online that's so convenient you can do it from the safety of your own home, praying you to pop that button on your Thanksgiving pants in peace. All it takes is a few moments for an online assessment in order to best match you with the licensed counselor best suited to your needs. In most cases, a professional BetterHelp consultant will contact you within 48 hours of signing up. That's pretty neat. So, don't let it rain on your parade. Sit down and check it out. I want you to start living a happier life today and enjoy Thanksgiving this week. As a bonus, Scary Stories Told in the Dark listeners will get 10% off of their first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash horror. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first three spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and our other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. 
Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> We begin with a sampler of sorts, two openers, before we get to the main event, if you will. In our first story from David Fueling, we meet a quartet whose trip to learn more about life ends up being a lesson in death, and things even worse than that. Without further ado, I present to you, In the Desert. We trekked out into the middle of the desert to find solitude to achieve greater introspective insight than we could have ever achieved in the real world, as Jeff put it. That was our goal. When there's no wind and no sound beside your own breathing, you can really meditate on what you are. Well, that's what he said. When there's nothing besides hot, uniform sand in all directions, and no life besides the occasional lonely scorpion tumbling over the dunes, you can see yourself more clearly than anyone has ever seen you. That's what he promised. So Jeff, Jane, Stephen, and I, we hiked out into the middle of this stretch of sand to find ourselves. Well, at least that was the plan. It was noon on the third day of our trip when Jane began to suffer from stomach pains. By one in the afternoon, Jeff began to complain of thirst and to guzzle of water. It took the strength of both Stephen and me to seize his canteen away from him. His voracious drinking threatened to leave us all stranded with nothing left. He was so wild and heedlessly frantic with thirst that we ended up needing to bind his hands and feet with rope to keep him still. Jane began vomiting a little before nightfall and didn't stop heaving and retching all night. I stayed with her and held back her hair and gave her tissue from my bag to dry the tears that were forming in her eyes. I tried to medicate her, but it didn't help at all. Stephen stayed with Jeff and fed him little sips of water because throughout the whole night he never stopped struggling and begging for a drink. Jeff died around three in the morning. We'd given him as much water as we could without jeopardizing the survival of the rest of us, but he always wanted more. We tried to sedate him, but there was nothing that could quell his thirst. He died, Stephen told me, with the word water on his lips. Jane died just as the sun was rising. She was so sick and so pained throughout the night that I could tell she didn't have much left, even before she began to fade away. By about four in the morning, I'd stopped trying to medicate and cure. For the rest of the night, I just prayed. Stephen and I ate breakfast silently. We left our companions where they died. We didn't know what to do with them. We couldn't stand to see them like that anymore. Stephen and I ate together for perhaps ten minutes before he, in one quick and deliberate motion, pulled his revolver out from his knapsack and shot himself in the temple. I sat for what must have been a half hour, just staring ahead at Stephen's slumped body, watching the blood mix with the sand to create a deep red slurry. I might have sat there forever if I hadn't been startled by a deep, velvet voice behind me. My apologies for the mess with your three friends, but it seemed the quickest way to achieve a private interview with you. I spun around to face this voice that had so suddenly addressed me. A lithe young man sat leisurely in the sand, looking earnestly into my face. He wore cargo shorts and a dark blue t-shirt and expensive-looking sandals. You acted quickly and efficiently with both Jeffrey and Jane. He continued, intelligently, I might add. I had hoped to exhaust a bit more of your water and supplies through them to give me a few more bargaining chips with you. But, c'est la vie, he said with a wave of his hand. I had Stephen shoot himself cleanly and quickly because I was done playing games. I've grown to respect you too much to continue to fritter away your time as I did with the other two of your compatriots. He smiled kindly, and his eyes gleamed merrily. So, let's get down to business, 
he said suddenly, widening his smile. Again, due to my newfound respect for your level of intelligence and mental clarity, I won't sugarcoat it. I'm in the market for your soul. Normally, I might offer you something very big and exciting for it, but I'm, above all else, a businessman. This means that I realize, as should you, that you're in a position without room to negotiate, and I intend to capitalize on this fact. Out here in the desert with limited food and water, I call all the shots. So, I am in effect extorting you for your soul. I need your soul. I'll make life as uncomfortable as possible for you in the meantime until you agree to this. The only offer on the table for you at the moment is a painless death. It's all I can and will offer you, but I can assure you that this offer will look increasingly attractive the longer you take to accept it. He sat back in the sand and looked up while letting his eyes flutter shut. After letting his face bask in the sun for a few seconds, he looked back at me. The small, sweet smile never left his lips. What do you say? Are we going to have to go through this whole song and dance of your suffering? Or can I trust you to be mature enough not to haggle with me? He asked, and his smile became condescending. You're the devil, I demanded with something of a choked laugh. You're tempting me like you tempted Christ in the desert. No, 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 he exclaimed. My dear sir, you are kidding yourself if you think you are important enough to pique the interest of Satan himself. I'm an errand boy. I do little jobs here and there to make my quota of monthly souls. I noticed you and your friends out here all alone and decided to make a quick job of it. It's tough to corrupt multiple souls at once. You'll have to take my word for that. So I singled you out, admittedly, quite at random. And now, here we sit. And still, I wait for your answer. I won't make any deal with you. I was all I could say before I was rendered mute by a searing pain that snaked through my gut and ran up the sides of my esophagus. My teeth felt like they were going to explode to shatter in my mouth. I felt thirstier than I've ever felt in my life. I reached for my canteen with panicked hands and worked frantically to unscrew the cap. The young man rose and sauntered over, picking it up from my weak, shaking grasp. He unscrewed the cap and poured the water all over his face and head, using the last of it to slick back his hair. Now, look here. He whispered harshly as he bent over my convulsing form in the sand, letting a few drops of water fall from his greasy hair onto my body. If you don't start being reasonable, I'm going to have scorpions tripping the light fantastic inside your skull. I'm going to have maggots setting up shop in your genitals. His grimace turned back into that serene smile that he wore so naturally. The pain suddenly stopped, and I was left shivering on the ground with exhaustion and fear. I'll make a new deal, I shouted hoarsely. The young man's face became cold again, and I felt the pain beginning to rise in my gut once more. Don't waste my time, he warned. I have a wife at home, I continued, and a son. Take them and leave me alone. The young man smiled widely. Included our business, he grinned. But not in the way you intended, he added. You're not allowed to make deals with souls besides your own, obviously. He said it as if this were a simple rule that I'd merely forgotten. However, to try to sacrifice, to sell your own family for comfort is a damnable sin. Literally so. I've garnered your soul for Satan through fear and pain. I didn't even have to make a deal with you. You could have taken my offer of a quick and easy death, but now you walk away from the table with nothing. The pain in my gut flared upward to the extremities of my body. The blood in my veins seared me with every beat of my heart. Good day, sir, he smiled as he turned to walk away. 
It may seem like it takes an eternity to die out here, but I promised you I'll be seeing you soon. I hope you enjoyed In the Desert by author David Fueling, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscurrypodcast.com slash David dash Fueling. That's simplyscurrypodcast.com slash David dash F-E-U-L-I-N-G. He's written several works available in book or Kindle format. If you think that the tales you're listening to tonight simply aren't enough, and if you haven't given the thing that stocks the fields a look, then maybe it's time you did. If you do decide to stop by, please leave David a kind word and let him know you heard about him on this show and that Otis sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Ever notice how people think they can get the upper hand when they bargain with devils? It's almost like they think they can outwit something that is potentially older than time itself. You'd think some people would know better. But then again, not every college degree is a winner. But it would also appear family in our last story wasn't as close as we might have been led to believe. Let's instead take a look at one that's a bit closer. Maybe not quite all there, but closer. At least in this household, the mother keeps herself busy with her dolls. But these aren't your typical dolls, and mother seems a bit obsessed with them. Is there such a thing as going too far? Without further ado, I present to you the Faceless Dolls. My mother and I used to live together in a large house on the crest of a hill. We had a sitting room that overlooked the churchyard cemetery a short ways down the road. I rarely went into that room as a child because that's where my mom kept most of the faceless dolls. Later, I learned that they're also called shy kid or hide-and-seek dolls. They're life-sized and posed with their hands clasped in front of them. They can be propped up in corners or against walls, and it looks like a child is covering their eyes as they sulk in time out, or count to ten, as part of a hiding game. They're designed to face the wall, and so the front side is usually unfinished and doesn't look like a person at all. As an eight-year-old, I was creeped out by their limpness and how they slumped slowly down the if mom didn't readjust them every few days. I didn't like how their poses always seemed to involve hiding or being upset to justify how they always stood with their backs turned to the room. Most of all, I remember how traumatizing it was the first time that I inspected one of them to find nothing except a lumpy and threadbare bag of nylon where the child's face should be. The cotton-like fiber fill that stuffed the doll to give it its shape poked out through the nylon exterior in places, and my imagination took over. I saw a face that was screaming in terror, with a pair of two small eyes and a jagged irregular mouth near the doll's chin. Mom kept about twelve of these dolls in the room overlooking the cemetery. She had maybe another dozen scattered all around the house. There was at least one in every room, including my bedroom, and they all had names. There was a Mary a Constance, an Abigail, an Adam, a Jeremiah, and many others I no longer remember. Mom called the one in my bedroom Peter and forbade me to move him. He's your brother, she would scold me, with real fury in her eyes. You both share this bedroom. The police came to arrest my mom one day, and I went to live with my grandmother, who I call Nana. I didn't see Mom after that, and Nana always refused to talk about it. We lived that way for five years. Around the time I turned 13, she let slip that Mom was being let out soon. I managed to press my grandmother for the first hints of what really happened. 
Your mother lost her mind when Peter died, she said hesitantly. Until then, I had no idea that Peter was even an actual person. She had you two years later, but losing her firstborn son in a drowning like that. Nana lost her composure for a few seconds. She never recovered. That's why she collected the dolls, I said in astonishment. But why was she arrested? Nana shook her head and took in a deep breath. She started getting mixed up about what was real and what was pretend. She did something bad, and she's been in a mental hospital for the past five years. She'll be out soon, though. My grandmother tried to look brave, but couldn't quite manage it. I'm hoping she feels a lot better when we see her again. Nana drove me to visit Mom, but didn't want to stay herself. I'm sorry, she told me as the car idled in Mom's driveway. I just can't face her. Call me as soon as you're ready to be picked up or if anything seems weird. I, I will, I said. Mom was excited to see me when I walked in the door, but not quite in the way I expected. She seemed gaunt and wild, crazier than I imagined she would ever look. I remembered our well-kept childhood home, but her new apartment was messy and barely furnished at all. She called me by name and hugged me, then asked, Did you bring your change of clothes? Yes, I nodded, and indicated the backpack that I was carrying. Mom had been adamant on the phone that I bring something to change into. I thought she just didn't want me wearing dirty clothes if I stayed over through tomorrow, but I was wrong. Good, she exclaimed. I've been waiting so long to show you this. She led me toward the back of the apartment until I saw something that made my heart skip. In the corner of the bedroom was an undressed, shy kid, a figure that was as tall as I was. It stood with its forehead resting against the wall with both hands in its pockets. Did you make this? I asked hesitantly. I had to, she beamed. You've grown so much, I couldn't buy one this big, and I even had to ask Nana for your height. It's... it's me? It's you, she affirmed happily. Now change out of your clothes so we can dress you. I realized abruptly that Mom was referring to both me and the doll as you. We're... we're two iterations of the same person in her mind. I don't want to give the doll my clothes, Mom, I said. I could feel my voice shaking as her face changed from brightly excited to furious. Do you know how hard it was for me to keep Peter's old shirt and pants while I was in the hospital? I had to let them take everything else away. She marched suddenly out of the room and I followed her timidly. As I turned the corner to find her, I saw that she was pulling a hunting rifle out of the hallway closet. You're not supposed to have that, Mom, I whispered. I suddenly felt very sure that I was going to die. She didn't answer because she was entirely fixated on loading the rifle. Her hands were trembling and she fumbled while she did so. It was then that I pushed past her and made for the door. How dare you, she shrieked. I could hear her footfalls following me. I remember my backpack full of spare clothes and I threw it down before running out of the apartment. Keep the clothes, I screamed and slammed the door shut behind me. I kept running, but Mom never opened the door to pursue me. Maybe the backpack was all she really wanted. I got home as quickly as I could. I jogged and slowed to a walk when the stitch in my side became too painful. It took me over an hour to make it back to Nana's house without a car. We called the cops as soon as I told her what had happened, and I hadn't heard from my mother since that night. Nana never talked about it, and I was honestly afraid to ask her. Nana died when I was 17, and I got myself emancipated as an adult because there was no one left in my life to take me in. After my grandmother's funeral, I decided to find out what really happened once and for all. The criminal records told me everything I needed to know. The cops couldn't find Mom at first. When I fled and hurried home after she brandished the rifle and demanded my clothes, Mom was alone for about an hour and a half before anyone came for her. 
In that time, she must have hastily constructed her own faceless doll. There were pictures of the apartment as it appeared when the police first arrived. The house was empty except for three faceless dolls seated around the kitchen table. Mom's doll was a roughly humanoid form with stuffed pantyhose for skin and wearing Mom's best outfit. It was posed to be slumped over at the kitchen table as though collapsing in a sobbing fit and burying its head in its hands. Also seated at the table were two smaller dolls, positioned similarly with their heads down. One was the teenager-sized one that represented me, and the other looked like a child. I'm sure it was meant to be Peter. They found her in her underwear, crushed to death in a garbage truck's trash compactor. I think Mom climbed into a relatively empty dumpster and waited to die. Now that her family of dolls was perfect without her, she just threw herself away. I went back into the older records of Mom's criminality. It gets so much worse. The charges from her first arrest read as follows. Interfering with a burial ground, desecration of a corpse, and attempted abduction. Mom had been going to the cemetery and digging up bodies to dress her dolls. Among her targets were long-dead children named Mary, Constance, Abigail, Adam, and Jeremiah. I can sometimes see the dolls' outfits in my mind and how anachronistic they often were. It all finally makes sense. The police finally caught on when Mom graduated from simple grave robbing. She apparently tried to lure a girl named Ruth into her car. That's when Mom went away for the first time. I'll always love my mother, but I can't forgive her. To this day, whenever I see a human form facing away from me, there's always a split second of wondering how horrible the things I can't see might turn out. Support for this episode is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. So, like I was saying, the red X's on my calendar are inching even closer to my least favorite holiday, leaving me feeling depressed even before it begins. The thoughts of holiday gatherings make me feeling more tired than 10 turkey helpings. I mean, sure, I could just as easily order in ahead of time but that's not exactly the spirit of the season, is it? Family gatherings don't always have to be stressful, do they? However, it's not all bad, because BetterHelp is there to remind you that Thanksgiving is only one day of the year. Communication has never been easier or better. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, nor is it self-help. It's professional counseling done online that is so convenient that you can do it from the safety of your own home. Their licensed professionals specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, anger, family conflicts, self-esteem, and a number of other personal difficulties. All it takes is a few moments of your time for an online assessment in which your results are used in order to best match you with a licensed counselor best suited to your needs. What's better is, in most cases, a professional BetterHelp consultant will contact you within 48 hours of signing up. And you can't get those kind of results calling a traditional doctor's office these days, that's for sure. Also, did I mention that it's also more affordable than traditional offline counseling, with financial aid being available, leaving more money for your holiday shopping? Oh, jeez, another holiday with the ants. Uncles, nieces, sisters, cousins, nephews, neighbors, lonely co-workers, and the like. It goes on and on, doesn't it? So, take a break from Uncle Ralph's stories, get online, and give yourself something to truly be thankful for. A better path to positive mental health. I want you to start living a happier life today. As an added incentive, scary stories told in the dark listeners will get 10% off of their first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash horror. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. 
Thank you for your support of this program and of our sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed The Faceless Dolls by author David Fueling, as performed by yours truly. No, no, if you want to play dress-up, you don't go to the graveyard. People find that stuff out. Just ask for donations from your family and neighbors. My neighbor just sent me a box of clothes. Granted, I didn't ask for them, and she did say to keep them someplace safe for the next few months. But it's the thought that counts. But maybe the things to be worried about aren't our own family members. Some of them are perfectly fine and normal, and not engaged in hobbies most of us would find unusual. Maybe there's just something in the house lurking around, waiting for us to go to sleep. In our third tale by David Fueling, we'll hear more about a cousin and his close encounters with things he just can't explain, and that you should never trust a growing collection of insects in your room. Without further ado, I present to you Bug City. My cousin AJ told me this story in 2006. He was 27 years old and would soon be on his deathbed. A.J. claims that he got sick because of what happened to him back in 1998. He was 19 then. Now that he's gone, I can't ask him any more questions. This is everything I know. A.J. kept a pin board in his room that was covered in a messy starburst of theories. Some of it was nonsense. There were clipped conspiracy pamphlets and pages torn from trash tabloids. Government cover-ups were linked to articles about extraterrestrial conspiracies. At the center was a dense hub of scientific reports alongside obvious pseudoscience. Subliminal communication was the connection there. A.J. was obsessed with faster-than-light messaging. I've looked at the pinboard since A.J. died, but I can't make much sense of it yet. I was 13 when A.J. spilled his guts to me. We were taking a break from video games. And I was drinking a soda, leafing through a comic book while my cousin noodled on his guitar. He kept looking up at me, and I could tell he wanted to discuss something, but didn't know how to start. What's up, man? I prompted. He put his guitar aside. It might take the whole afternoon. I guess I got time. I told him, not quite diverting my attention from the comic. I was still reading it when A.J. rose and grabbed the pages away. But I really need you to listen. I saw that he was serious and gave him my attention. It was around January of 98 when A.J. found a bug that had died on the ceiling. It was stuck overhead with its legs pointed straight down toward the ground. Somehow it died on its back and stayed there despite walking upside down above his head during the last seconds of its life. A.J. almost dismissed this as a freak occurrence, but kept it in mind as he decided to look around. He found a second bug with its legs also pointing toward the center of the room. It died on its back, as insects usually do, but it was stuck to the wall despite the normal pull of gravity. Its legs were pointed toward him, as he plucked it from its place and threw it in the trash. A.J. pondered the empty space that was the center of his room. It was an unfurnished vacancy with little in the way of decorations. Looking back, A.J. said, it's obvious how that emptiness was the centerpiece. It was the focal point of the strangeness. That's not obvious to me, I told him. Just listen, he answered. At first, A.J. left most of the insects where they died. He was messy by nature, so clearing them away wasn't a priority. Besides, he said, I wanted to keep observing. I thought I could figure it out. When the spiders started spinning themselves down from the ceiling just to curl up and die, he finally gave his room a deep cleaning. I walked in one day to find five of them, A.J. told me. 
five spiders, all dead in midair, like ornaments hanging from silk filaments. I started aggressively disposing of the bug bodies. That's when things really got weird. H.J. says the lights outside his window started on the night after he cleaned out the dead bugs from his house. Not when I first put them in the wastebasket, he clarified, but the night after I moved them out to the driveway trash can. I never had sleep paralysis before that, but it's been happening ever since. I remember the bags under A.J.'s sunken, haunted-looking eyes. I could easily believe that he hadn't slept well for almost ten years. You think the bugs were giving you nightmares? I scoffed and tried to grab my comic book back from the dresser where he'd put it. That's stupid. A.J. got to the comic first, pulled it away from me and tossed it behind his bed. Hey! A.J. stared down my smirk and turned me solemn again. When they build a dam over a river, the animals go crazy. Some die, some start acting strangely, and some change their behavior completely. If there was some kind of invisible energy that was in flux over this house, it makes sense that nature would start to do things that I'd notice. What did the bugs have to do with energy flux? I was waxing sarcastic again. Fine, maybe it's stupid. AJ acknowledged it gravely. But maybe I simply don't have enough pieces of the story yet. He stared deliberately at the soda I was drinking, and when he spoke again, his rambling seemed to have changed to a new topic. They put something in the water between three and four in the morning. The elves do it. They want to poison all the insomniacs and night owls. I felt worried to hear him talk like this. From my perspective, A.J. was mentally ill. This seemed obviously to be paranoid and delusional talk. My attention turned to wondering how I might facilitate getting my older cousin the help he needed. I kept my mouth shut for the time being, though. H.A. hadn't come to me because he wanted help. Right now, he needed someone to listen to his story. The lights outside my windows appeared for the first time after I visited Bug City in my dreams. They turn off again whenever my eyes are open, and they only appear when the rest of this house is asleep. My family goes to bed earlier than I do, so the lights are usually there to wake me back up. As recently as last night, the lights clicked on right as I shut my eyes to rest. I think it's how the elves give me the dream. I've been having it ever since I threw away the bugs. It's a dream I cut in. It's your imagination. I didn't even know where to begin questioning the idea of a light that only A.J. could see when his eyes were closed. But the dream always comes before the sleep paralysis, A.J. insisted. Please, just let me describe it to you. I'm on the outdoor patio of a cafe-style restaurant. I don't know where it is, but I can sense that it's somewhere foreign and far away. It's dark outside and the air is dry and hot. It's a pleasant summer night. There's too much light pollution to see the stars. I can't even find the moon. The sky is like a flat gray ceiling overhead. The only hint that we're really outside is the yellow-orange stain of the streetlights. Their light diffuses up through the fog to fade into nothing above us. I think that I'm eating with friends when I arrive in the dream. But I'm never sure who these people are. We're relaxing. My friends and I are always happy at the beginning, even though I know what's coming next. All at once, people start running past our table in a panic. They're fleeing down the street, and my friends and I don't know what's happening. We all jump up and join them in running away. In the chaos, I get separated from everyone else. I try running down alleyways, but the side streets are all walled off. I try climbing up fire escapes, but there's no way to get inside any of the buildings. Every time that I hit a dead end, I find other people who've also hit that same dead end. Whenever I ask someone where we are, they answer me without surprise. I guess it's natural not to know. Every time I ask, they tell me urgently, we're in Bug City. There's no way out. AJ, wait, I interrupted. If everyone understands that there's no way out, then why do they keep running away? Why would people try to escape if they already know it's impossible? <laughs> That's a good question. A.J. laughed. 
I wondered about that a lot. He frowned. But think about it this way. His hand shot out in front of himself as though he were recounting a grand theory that required his whole body to describe. If you or I were trapped inside a hopeless situation with nothing to do but wait, don't you think we'd occupy our time to try for a miracle? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, I admitted, but what's the deal with this dream? It sounds like a regular nightmare. I was dangerously close to calling out A.J. on the threads of nonsense with which he became obsessed. I listened while he told me about his first encounter with the elves. I woke up. My head was tilted up toward the bedside window, and my eyes were staring out into our backyard. There were three lights in a triangle outside, one by the lamppost, another high in the sky, and then a third burning like a fallen star right on our lawn. Beneath the covers, I felt something crane my neck down toward my own feet. The three lights in the triangle followed my vision inside, through my closed window pane, and shrunk down to attach themselves to a darkened figure that I suddenly realized was standing there in the room with me. I woke up for a second time. I'm not sure what transpired in the blank of unconsciousness that blotted me out. I was back in my room, but I, I couldn't move. The elves almost seem like people, but you can tell that they're not. It's in the way they move. There's no footfalls. Their joints don't articulate. The elves' limbs just kind of flow out from their bodies. One was staring into my face. It had at least a dozen eyes, and they were all targeted on me. Another elf was doing something in the corner of my room. I couldn't exactly see it clearly. I tried to turn my head away from the one that was staring at me, but I was paralyzed. Down even to my smallest muscles, there was no autonomy at all. I tried to bunch my hand into a fist against the bed, but even my fingers were frozen. AJ got choked up. He was becoming upset that I was uncomfortable to see him. My cousin didn't ever cry in front of me, nor did he usually struggle for words. Both were happening now. He continued. One had a face like three lights in a triangle. I mentioned him already. He came in through the window. He brought friends that weren't like him, though. There was another with a head that was perfectly round. Imagine it, two bulbous eyes on either side of its face. It had a gaping mouth, too, like one of those bubble-eyed goldfish. They didn't communicate with me. They didn't even try to. It was like a laboratory mouse, and they were only there to perform some operation on me. The first one stared into my face the whole time. The other one was working on something I couldn't see. It barely made noise, but there were small sounds as it brushed against this or that in my room. My heart was pounding. My eyes were wide open, but then I lost consciousness. It was abrupt. I was staring into the face of this thing, and then suddenly I was completely out. When I woke up a second time, it was morning outside. I could move my limbs again. All the dead bugs had been replaced on my walls and ceiling. Thirteen-year-old me was getting spooked by this description at this point, so I tried to lighten things with a joke. I bet you left the bugs alone this time, right? I did, A.J. said. They stayed there until they rotted away. The parts that were left, their little shells, stayed stuck to the wall. The spiders started spinning themselves down again. If I knocked them down or tried to move them before they died, they'd run straight back into a spin and do a new thread at the center of the ceiling. For a while, I would crush them and leave them in the corner of the room. I felt the need to interrupt the ritual, but I was afraid to throw the bodies out. My Uncle Maz interrupted us by knocking on A.J.'s door and then letting himself in before A.J. could answer. Sternly, he asked, which one of us messed with his ham radio set? It's fried to hell, he said. Somebody ruined it. Oh, it wasn't me. A.J. answered. He abruptly flattened and folded himself against the wall, pulling his knees to his chest and wrapping his arms tightly around them. My cousin reminded me of a cornered cat in that moment, 
hunched and scowling with every muscle tensed for action. I know that A.J. wasn't afraid of Uncle Maz. Those two were closer than best friends. Maz shrugged and left the room, grumbling about his broken radio. Why'd that make you so nervous, I asked. A.J. realized he'd tightened himself into an anxious huddle. It took a few seconds for him to relax and answer me. They mess with electronics. The elves do. That's how they send me threats. I was finishing my soda and A.J. tossed me another one. He was eager to make sure I didn't get up and leave, not even briefly, to go to the kitchen. Okay, I asked as I cracked the tab on my fresh can. So, who's been threatening you? I call them elves. I guess I needed a name for them, but I don't remember how it started. Maybe they told me in a dream. They don't talk to me at all when they're here. But they send me messages between their visits. He let himself become agitated again. The next sentence that came was blurted out. My friend Petro played the theremin. AJ's eyes darted in a circle around himself while he spoke. Do you know what that is? I shook my head. No. It's a musical instrument, he said, but it's different than most. It's an electronic device with a pair of proximity sensors built in. There's a loop of metal that sticks out horizontally, and then a second antenna that goes straight up. Both of these wires pick up anything that's passing through the air nearby. It translates those disturbances into sound. Okay, I urged him along. So, your friend Petra brought her theremin over. I cracked a small smile. But the harsh look on AJ's face made it clear he wasn't joking. Yes, I, I asked her to bring it. When he was sure I was taking him seriously again, AJ explained, We set it up in my bedroom one night. We left it powered on and stayed up in the living room, watching TV until we heard it start to sing. It sings? What do you mean? We set it to play a steady hum at a low volume. If nothing came near it, the droning sound wouldn't change. It hummed evenly for most of the night. The pitch and volume started changing around 2.30 in the morning. So what did you hear? The vowels were modulated through the pitch of the instrument's whining. The consonants were formed out of static and clicking. It sounded like the machine was breaking and failing to register something. I remember. AJ chuckled, then rubbed his head pensively. I remember Petra saying I'd have to pay her back if they broke it. He took a deep breath and continued. Petra and I agree that it was saying, Welcome to, followed by something we couldn't quite hear. Petra wrote down, Beg CD on a piece of paper. She thought it was a name. Uh, that's not what I heard, though. You heard Bug City, I responded. A.J. nodded somberly. Petra and I stayed up all night, and she went home in the morning. I was alone again the night after that, and I slept like a log because I was exhausted. I don't know if my weakness is why the elves come back, or if it's because we eavesdropped on them during the previous night. Whatever the reason, the night after the theremin was when they finally carved me up. N Nobody carved you up, A.J. argued. Not where you can see it, he frowned. Shut up for a second while I describe it to you. A.J. launched into another tangent. He said he could trace this all back to a certain type of old radio tower component, the Leyden Ewald 2403 capacitor. He told me while tapping a photocopy of some dubious article on his pinboard. The LE 2403 was invented, installed worldwide, then abandoned almost as quickly. They ripped it out of every tower over the next few years as problems sprung up. Something major went wrong, and they tried to destroy their mistake. The LE-2403 units were allegedly built in the late 80s and early 90s. My cousin's story reminded me of those old urban legends claiming that cell towers cause cancer and headaches, and I told him so. They don't do anything like that, he insisted. At least not directly. I think what they really do is get in the way of the elves' communications. That's what causes the phenomena. Hey, Jay, I pressed. Who dissected you? My cousin sighed and continued. After Pitra left, I started doing some math. It 
was all rough triangulation, but I did my best. AJ laughed. I hid aluminum foil in corners that I expected to be problem areas. I plugged any nooks where bugs might crawl out with even more foil. I set a big floor mirror where the theremin had started singing and positioned it to face toward the cell tower outside. AJ pointed through his window at the woodlands behind his house. There's a cell tower out there? I asked skeptically. The trees were thick enough that there was no clue of anything man-made beyond them. AJ nodded. I can't get to it because of all the razor wire and locked gates, but it's out there. In any case, I didn't really have a specific plan. I was just trying to make the strangeness stop. It was evening by the time I was done, and I started thinking things might actually be okay. I dozed off, and that's when it happened. AJ says that he woke up completely immobilized. He'd been sleeping on his back with his head turned to the left as it rested against its pillow. This position exposed his neck and also allowed his eyes to focus on the digital clock radio in the corner of the room. It was 3.47 a.m. There's so many stories about silhouette figures entering the room and standing over you, but that description doesn't do it justice. It's not just a shadow. It's a flesh and blood thing that your senses aren't fully understanding. I couldn't look down to see what they were putting in me or how the implantation was performed. There were limbs pressing down on my chest and stomach, and then a sharp pain like something was eating its way through me. Imagine a horsefly bite but happening over and over and over again. It was a constant sensation until the pain was deep inside my core, and then it stopped abruptly. The pressure against my limbs withdrew, and the silhouettes left me alone. The device travels around inside my body. That's why they can't find it. I can feel it moving, and it's painful when it does. One doctor sent me through an MRI and found a few tracks of scar tissue snaking around inside me. The device doesn't seem to show in images, though. The weirdest part is that the bugs stopped collecting in my room. It must have something to do with the implant. Whenever I go on a hike, I can't even get mosquitoes to come bite me. They won't come anywhere near me anymore. About a year after A.J. told me all of this, I visited him in the hospital. He was dying, but the doctors couldn't identify the reason for his failing health. I'll remember the last thing A.J. ever said to me for the rest of my life. Previous to that point, we enjoyed a long conversation about normal things. We talked about our favorite memories, our family, and our future. When my parents said it was time to go home, A.J. asked them for one more minute. He wanted to tell me something in private. My parents left the room, and he told me. The bugs were indicating something with their legs when they died. It's not clear what. It's bigger than you and me. It's bigger than all of us. I guess this is goodbye. So try not to forget what I told you. I told him I wouldn't forget and gave him my own attempt at a satisfying goodbye. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I cried especially hard on the car ride home. At the time, I didn't really understand why I'd suddenly gotten so upset. But now I know it was a combination of sensing the loss of my cousin and the confusion of not knowing what to believe about what he'd told me. I've checked since A.J. died and the documentation of the laden Ewald 2403 capacitor, if such a thing ever existed at all, has been completely wiped off the Internet. All the same, my research yielded something interesting about the tower in the woods behind A.J.'s house doesn't appear on any official registry of towers or antenna. Could there really be an operational LE-2403 unit that's still out there? My cousin was a natural storyteller, and so I guess on some level at least, I always assumed he was indulging in fantasy. I mostly listened to AJ's stories because he was very sick, and I enjoyed spending time with him. At most, I thought he probably only half-believed all the crazy things that he was saying. It seemed like we were just bonding through wild speculation. When A.J. passed away, 
I realize this all truly might be real. I found out eventually that AJ insisted on being cremated. He claimed it would be the only way to destroy the evidence that was implanted inside him. I never really believed him about the strange nodules in his body that nobody else ever noticed. I reasoned that if the doctors couldn't find them, they must not have existed at all. That's what I thought, at least, before my uncle got a call from the funeral home, which changed my mind. The mortuary director said he couldn't give us A.J.'s ashes. In fact, we'd never see his remains. The director could only explain that something went wrong during the cremation. Two weeks later, I heard A.J.'s parents crying over a letter they received in the mail. Within six months, they'd moved out of that old house. My Uncle Maz brings it up whenever he's been drinking. He thinks A.J.'s body must have self-destructed or something while inside the cremation chamber. He told me about it more than a dozen times, usually with tears in his eyes when he does. The whole building was evacuated, he always says. We had the feds at our door telling me my son's remains are gone and he's left behind a goddamn crime scene. I wonder who A.J.'s tormentors were and what they put inside him. I can't imagine why they had to take him away from us. There's no evidence now. We only have our stories, and so I can't really say anything for sure about Bug City. Things like elves, superluminal transmissions, shadowy figures, and Bug City mean very little to me except what AJ's described. Details don't matter to me, though. I've decided I believe him. I hope you enjoyed Bug City by author David Fueling, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website, just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash david-fueling. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash david-f-e-u-l-i-n-g. If you're feeling brave, you can dive into even more of his collections of misdeeds, monsters, and other unpleasantries that would look great on your bookshelf, digital or otherwise. And I'm sure they'd look back just as hard. As a reminder, if you do decide to give any of this talented author's stories a read, please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote, and be sure to let them know you heard about them here on this program and that me, Otis Jiry, sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure David would much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs, or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. 
Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep if you can. <laughs>